compass and a ruler. Um, I made that statement in a meeting a couple years ago, and after church, this very eager, spirited young boy walked up to me with a sheet of paper, eight and a half by 11, on which he had drawn out step by step in about 15 steps, how to draw a step figure. Instructions, and at the end, an illustration. So step one, draw a circle, and there was a circle. Step two, draw a line on the circle, and there's a circle with a line. And he, draw, he directed me all the way through. So now I know how to draw a step figure. It's just that I still can't do it. But anyway, my wife and brother are artists, and some of their work is back there. Uh, I am an author, and the books are back there. I'll say much about them throughout the meetings, but I'll just call your attention to the book in the center of the table. It's entitled God's Forever Word, and uh, it is a book on the subject of inspiration and preservation of the scriptures. And uh, I do not come at that subject the way uh, many other authors have done comparing all the different versions, how they say this verse or don't say it, or how this verse is left out here and so on. I, I approach the subject of inspiration and preservation uh, from a different standpoint, and I trust that you'll pick that book up. I believe it'll be a help to you. And there's also a book back there far on the far right uh, entitled Young Heroes. This is a book uh, written about young people in the Bible who did something important for God before they reached the age of 20. And uh, you'll find it interesting, about 43 chapters in there. And some of these people are familiar to you, and some of them you will be thinking, oh, yeah, that person is in the Bible. But uh, they're, they're all listed out there for you. That book is illustrated by my older brother, and so you'll find illustrations throughout that book of the different Bible characters. I tell him I chose him because he is my older brother and he's old enough to remember what all those people look like. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, we'll pick up the reading this morning on this uh, Sunday morning, the first day of spring. Notice verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, now we, we see here a skip of 40 years. In between verse 23 and verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. I wonder where he learned that. He learned it from parents who didn't fear the wrath of the king. And now notice the Bible says, For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Then we see verse 28, Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. We've already prayed this morning, so I want to open up this subject of uh, revival, and I want to focus this morning uh, by using the example of Moses on three stages of life, or three, uh, three issues that we will all face. We begin this passage with the childhood of Moses. Now, not much is said in the Bible about his childhood. We know the very touching story of, of Miriam waiting down at the water's edge as the ark was there. And by the way, uh, Moses' parents were very, very in, in, intuitive, and they were very ingenious. They found a way to obey God and also obey the king. They did put him in the river, exactly as they were told. The, the law that the king made did not say they couldn't put him in an ark in the river. He just had to put him in the river. It didn't say they had to put him out in the middle of the river where the current would sweep him out to the Mediterranean Sea. No, they, they, there was nothing in the law that said you couldn't stick him in the flags where he couldn't float away. 
There was nothing that said anything other than you just got to put him in the river. And they did that. And Miriam is standing off there at the, at the uh, express instruction of, of her parents, uh, Amram and Jochebed, who said, now stand there. And when Pharaoh's daughter comes down to bathe, I want you to watch because she's going to hear the baby crying. And I'm sure that that morning, uh, Jochebed did not feed Moses. So he was hungry and he would naturally be crying and probably crying more loudly than normal. And, and so when Pharaoh's daughter came down, we, we see how uh, Miriam jumps out and says, oh, by the way, you want me to get a nurse for you? And you know that story. But there's not really a whole lot said about the childhood of Moses. Then we go later to the choices of Moses. The choices of Moses. And Moses made some choices. And they're connected to this idea of personal revival, a work of God in your life. What is revival? It's many things. The definition that I like to use is it is a fresh work of God in the life of a child of God. It is a fresh work of God in the life of a child of God. And God dealt with Moses in many stages of his life. And there were fresh works of God interspersed throughout his life. Moses had many personal revivals. So the childhood of jo Moses, the choices of Moses, and then I want you to see thirdly, the challenges of Moses. Because when challenges present themselves, it is an opportunity in everybody's life either to have revival or to experience reversal. Challenges will bring you to revival or reversal. You will either go forward a step with God in faith. You will go forward a step in hope. You will go forward a step in your joy. You will go forward a step in your peace. Or you will go backward in the challenges of life. So let's look at this this morning. We see here the childhood of Moses in verse 24, excuse me, 23. When he was born, he was hid three months of his parents. They saw that he was a proper child. It doesn't mean that when he was born, he had a halo over his head. It doesn't mean that when Moses was born, he was born talking and doing you know, logarithms and algebra. No, it just means that when they saw that baby, they knew this is one of God's children. We're not going to kill our son. I don't have time this morning and I won't weary you with my position on abortion and I won't weary you with my position on the, the thugs that commit abortion. But I want you to understand life is valuable. Amen. And the childhood of Moses took place in a home where there was the fear of God. And I want you to understand that everybody in this room may not have come from a family like that. Indeed, I did not come from a family like that. And the childhood is a formative time. And the childhood is an important time in the life of any individual. It is foundational and formative. And the childhood can be a time of revivals. You see that in the life of Josiah. The Bible tells us something about Josiah in the record of the kings. That there was no one before him or after him. Okay, now that puts Josiah in a class by himself. That means he was homeschooled. <laughs> Homeschoolers are always in a class by themselves. You ever seen the homeschool high five? Yeah. See, here is Moses, and he's brought up in a home with the fear of God. And in his childhood, he had opportunity for God to work in his life. 
He had opportunity. And I want you to see that in the book of Acts, chapter 7, we have the only other account dealing with some of Moses' childhood. And I want you to go back there. Acts chapter 7, keep your finger in Hebrews 11. But in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, uh, the first Christian martyr, was preaching a phenomenal sermon. This man was filled with the Holy Spirit. Not really the message this morning, but Peter was filled with the Spirit and 3,000 got saved when he preached. Stephen was filled with the Spirit and they stoned him at the end of the sermon. Now, I prefer people getting saved this morning to getting stoned, so keep that in mind if you will. In Acts chapter 7, I want you to notice what the Bible says about Moses beginning in verse <clears throat> 20, in which time Moses was born, referring, of course, to this Pharaoh who did not know Joseph and so on, and there was hardship in the uh, country. Uh, this king didn't know Joseph. He dealt subtly with the, with the people of God. Evil entreated our fathers to cast out their young children who they would not live, in which time Moses was born. By the way, can I, can I encourage you with something? Everybody's born in a bad time. Everybody's born at a good time. David served his own generation by the will of God. And the reason he did that is he had no other generation in which to serve God. Nobody in this room has any other time to do the will of God than right now. And so Moses was born. It reminds me of the opening line of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times and the worst of times, And there is no time that Moses could have been born that was any worse for a little boy, but there was no time that was any better. Amen. In which time Moses was born, Acts 7.20, and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now notice verse 22. A fact not found anywhere else in the scripture, not found in Exodus, not found in, in Hebrews. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was full 40 years old. So this matter of his being mighty in words and deeds began when he was a child. This began in his home and he was nourished up in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. This young man was trained in the wisdom of paganism. He was trained in the wisdom and the mathematics and the science of the world of his day. He heard it all. He was forced to study it. He was raised up, even though the son of godly, godly parents, he was raised up in an environment of Pharaoh's household and Pharaoh's daughter had mercy on the children as opposed to her father who hated little boys that were Jewish. However, she still trained him in worldly ways. But he was still mighty in word and deed. Amazing. And you know how that happens? I will tell you that that happens in the lives of young people who determine by the grace of God that even though they may be in a situation that is not conducive to Christianity and the development of a godly character, they make up their minds to walk with God anyway. And they have personal revival, even when it's discouraged, even when it might be mocked, even when it might be criticized, even when it might not be popular, even when it might not be, quote, the fashionable thing, end quote. We have this idea that is a false idea, that you have to be 21 before you can do anything for God. That is a false idea. 
And the book Young Heroes proves that because you see young people like Mary and young David and young Josiah and young Ruth and young Esther and you see godly people coming off the pages of Scripture. Amazing accounts, beautiful stories, a little maid found in 2 Kings chapter 5 and you can find these beautiful little nuggets, little, uh, I call them, uh, biographical cameos of children who didn't wait until they were grown up to be mighty in words and deeds. Jesus said this, out of the mouths of babes hast thou perfected strength. Babes are not exactly 21 years of age. The Bible tells us many things about children, and except you become as little children, you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven, referring to the innocence and the dependence of a child, referring to the, the child who, uh, Jesus said, if you would offend one of these that believe in me. That's an interesting statement. If you offend one of these little ones which believe in me. There is a faith in a child. It's not yet saving faith, but it is faith. And it is the faith that if it is nurtured, and if that child will work with it, and if that child will submit to God in it, that is the faith that will one day become saving faith. And that is the faith that will one day take that child into an adulthood of honor and glory to God. We don't know all the kinds and ways of Amram and Jochebed's conduct and contact with Moses as a child. However, what we do know is that he had enough. He had enough. So that when it came time to make choices, he made the right ones. I want to say something carefully here today because I know we're living in a culture of broken homes and broken hearts and broken dreams. But you can serve God if you want to. And if you do not want to, you will find an excuse. Anybody in this room who wants to serve God, anybody in this room who wants to have a victorious believer's life, anybody in this room who wants personal revival and, and steps and, and levels of growth, anyone who wants to say, I want to draw an eye to God so he'll draw an eye to me. I will submit myself to God and I will follow him. Anybody can do that. You can't use your parents as, as an excuse. You can't use your children as an excuse. You can't use your wife, sir. You can't use your husband, ma'am, as an excuse not to serve God. We all have or had a childhood. It was foundational and it was formative. And part of your childhood must be overcome, even if you grew up in the best of homes. Some people may have more to overcome than others, but the degree to which you must overcome your childhood is nothing more than an opportunity for the Spirit of God to show himself strong on your behalf. The eyes of the Lord are not running to and fro throughout the old earth to find somebody who will be strong on his behalf. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro to show himself strong on their behalf, the behalf of him whose heart is perfect toward him. And the perfect heart in that context is a heart that is resting and relying upon God. Revivals in childhood, you can have them and you should. Childhood ought to be a time where you develop and the very fact that we have young people in this audience this morning is an evidence to me that, that there are some young people who got up this morning and, and maybe you were forced at gunpoint to come to church, but I kind of expect you came here on your own. You know, maybe you rode in a car with someone who has a license to drive. I see some people I don't think you're old enough to drive yet, but then my wife and I see people at almost every red light and we think they're seven years old and they're driving. 
Can I just say it's a matter of perspective? When I look at this in the mirror and then I look at them, I think they, they can't be ever, any older than 12 years old. How is it legal for them to drive? They're 41, but anyway. <laughs> Every person in this room has a childhood. Some of you are still in it. Some of you have recently come out of it. Some of you are heading into the second one. Do you want us to raise our hand? That's totally up to you. Should I ask your wife which category this is? It's up to you. So... We go from the challenges to the choices and we see that when Moses was come to years, and if you're still here, in Acts chapter 7, the Bible says of Moses in verse 23, when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, seeing one of them suffer wrong. He defended him, avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. Now notice verse 25. Another fact about Moses not found anywhere else in the scripture. For he supposed... His brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And you know the story. The man ended up dying. I don't think Moses murdered him by premeditated intent. I think they got in a scuffle and Moses, in self-defense, hit the guy harder than he realized he hit him. And that was the end of the guy. And he hid him in the sand. And the news got out and Moses fled. And we know that. And we go back now to Hebrews chapter 11. And there we see that Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Here's the next word, choosing. So we move from childhood revival to choice revival. Do you know that every choice you make is either a choice toward revival or a choice toward reversal. Every choice you make. Every choice. The big choices, the little choices, and all the in-between choices. The choices you make when you're 17, and the choices you make when you're 45. Every choice is connected to revival. Or reversal. Every choice you'll ever make. And notice what Moses did when he was come to years. In other words, as he developed and he came into maturity, and we find in Acts 7, it's when he was 40 years old. He made a choice. And I will tell you that every choosing is accompanied by a refusing. Part of the problem with revival services is people come to the front and they kneel in prayer and they make a choice, but they don't refuse. It's opposite. And they go right back out and five weeks later or five days later, nothing has changed. Because they choose, but they don't refuse. Moses did both. Revival involves refusing and choosing. And every choice that you make in this life must be accompanied by a refusal of the opposite. Or you'll never go anywhere. You will sit on a merry-go-round for the rest of your life. Merry-go-rounds don't go anywhere. Children ride a merry-go-round and they go up and down and up and down and they go around in circles, kind of like the children of Israel in the wilderness. Do you realize they never went anywhere for 40 years except around and around and around? They never got anywhere. They never, they never possessed their possessions. They never possessed the promises that God gave them because they were unbelieving believers. They were saved, if we want to use that terminology. They came out in the Passover. They sprinkled the blood by faith. They were what we would call saved people today. But they never grew. They never developed. They did not achieve. You know why? Because they made wrong choices. And some of those choices seem very small. Griping about the fact there's no water. What would we do if we had no water? Well, praise the Lord, there's no water. <laughs> no, we'd probably gripe too. 
We'd probably be very much like them. And you see, they chose to gripe about little things, which, you know, I haven't mastered not griping. I'm not, I don't have a PhD in not griping. None of us probably do. But there has to be a choice, and he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now what this is about is that Pharaoh had no son, he had a daughter. And Moses was being trained in the household of his daughter to be the next Pharaoh, and he had at his disposal all the treasures in Egypt. That's what the Bible says in verse 26. He was esteeming the reproach of Christ. That is, in his thinking, he was saying the reproach of Christ is a greater kind and greater type and greater amount of riches than all the treasures in Egypt. Amen. You see what he was doing? He was choosing the spiritual over the carnal. Not only did he choose the spiritual, but he refused the carnal. He stopped that identity of the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He severed himself from that. He fled from that. It reminds me of Augustine walking down the street and Augustine had come out of a very wicked and immoral life and, and as he was walking home from a prayer meeting one night, as he looked up ahead, here came down the street one of his former lovers. And as he walked down the street, he did not stop and accommodate her. He greeted her and kept going. And after he had passed, she spoke up. She said, Augustine, it is I. Thinking, he didn't recognize my face in the dark, but he'll recognize my voice. Augustine's response was, but it is not I. Amen. Amen. Right. He refused something in order to choose, and he chose something that required a refuse. Choose, refuse. I will say this about revival. It doesn't matter who comes in here to preach. You could have some great preacher back from, you could bring Charles Haddon Spurgeon back from the dead here today, and he could preach his greatest messages. If you do not choose and refuse, you'll have no personal revival. If you refuse without choosing or you choose without refusing, You'll go nowhere. Revival is a fresh work of God in the life of a child of God. And if you refuse without choose, there will be no fresh work. And if you choose without the refuse, there will be no fresh work because the whole thing must have both parts. So we see the childhood of Moses and how that was connected to his foundation and his formation and how God used him in that way and how God uses everybody's childhood. As I said, I did not grow up in a Christian home. I was saved at the age of 17. And when I was saved, I knew nothing about the Bible other than what I had been told of the gospel message. I was a clean slate. Theologically, I was a filthy, dirty slate, practically. And God saved me and began a work. Amen. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. And God's still performing it. But I can tell you that as I look back on my childhood, even though I grew up in an unsaved home with an atheist father and an agnostic Jewish mother, I learned things in that home that I use every day of my life. Every single day. Things to do and things not to do. Ways to live and ways not to live. I use them every day. God knew where to put me. God did not make a mistake putting me in that home. And I've had many personal revivals overcoming things from my childhood. 
And I've also had many personal revivals based on refusing and choosing. What have you refused recently? What opportunity was presented to you and you didn't pull a Balaam and say, well, let me see if I can persuade God to let me do this. You said no. You refused and chose what God wanted and it was done. What situation has been presented? What opportunity, what circumstance of life has turned a, a corner and, and, the, and the vista is uh, the most beautiful opportunity and the most promising prospect you've ever imagined? And, but you knew there was something connected to it that God would not want. And you just said no. And you turned around and said yes. To what God had for you. Amen. Some of you will know the name Lee Robertson. Some of you may not know that as a young student, Lee Robertson was majoring in music and he was training for the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. He had a phenomenal voice. And even though he was in his 70s, when my wife and I were in college, we could still hear what was left of that gorgeous voice. He sang on the radio in the early days of radio. He sang for different churches and different preachers. And, and he was presented a contract for his voice when he was a young man. Shortly after he was saved, saved at the age of 18, which would have been 1927. The contract, however, required that Lee Robertson sing on Sundays. Not in church. He flatly rejected the offer. Amen. Now, had Lee Robertson signed that contract, probably none of us would ever have heard of him unless we happened to be opera buffs. And personally, not one of them. I've never enjoyed the sound of people getting their toenails pulled. <laughs> And if you like opera, that's okay with me. I don't choose to entertain myself that way. Perhaps if I understood the words, it would be a little more interesting to me. I don't approve of everything that Victor Borga ever did, but if you pull up Victor Borga uh, and his uh, little interpretation of an opera, it is the most hilarious thing you've ever seen, and I concur. And I will not ruin my voice this morning trying to imitate what he did. <laughs> but anyway, Lee Robertson went on to be a great preacher. He went on to be a great leader in fundamental circles because he refused at the same time he chose. You may know the name George Beverly Shea, a name that is not associated with independent Baptist fundamentalism, but a name certainly associated with gospel music. And you may not know, however, that a young man named George Beverly Shea was rebelling against the Lord and his parents were trying to channel his talents, his musical talents toward the things of God and Bev Shea was going the way of the world. And his mother was heartbroken and she was praying and begging God for him to devote his life to the Lord. And one day she ran across a poem. She copied the words down and put them on the piano because Bev Shea was a piano student. Bev Shea came home from work in his normal uh, attitude and sat down at the piano to do his perfunctory practice. And he's like, Mom, what's this poem? She said, it's a poem I found, and I, I would like it if you would put it to music for me. And he did. And God used it. And it became his signature song. I'd rather have Jesus Amen. than anything this world affords today. You see what happened to him? He had to refuse something in order to choose something else. He had a personal revival because he'd been saved as a little boy. 
And so we come to the challenges of Moses. And look, if you will, here, the first challenge is verse 26, where he had to mentally meet the challenge of worldly temptations. Notice the next one. He had to mentally and, and spiritually forsake Egypt, even though the king was angry with him and would have probably killed him if he could have. But notice what the Bible says. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. How do you see something that can't be seen? How do you do that? By faith. By faith. You see what I'm saying? And so, so revival uh, is, is in these challenging situations of life. I don't know what challenges your faith. Somebody in this room may be facing severe health challenges. All of us are facing severe gasoline challenges. <laughs> Some of us are facing sorrow challenges. Some of us are in, a, in, in, the, in the young stage. And you're either in courtship or you're in a new marriage and, and you're, you know, you're thinking about having children and you remember what your parents told you. You're going to have children just like you and that's frightening. <laughs> Unless you're one of those people that says, I'm perfect. <laughs> Notice he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood. He faced the challenge that God had said every firstborn in Egypt is going to die. He faced the challenge of the Red Sea. And once he got into the promised land, or into the wilderness, I mean, the challenge after challenge after challenge, challenges against his leadership, challenges where God said to Moses on three separate occasions, Moses, get out of the way. I will kill them all. And I'll start over with you, Moses. And I will make of you a better nation. What would you and I do with that? How would you and I respond to that? Because it's tempting to think that if everyone was just like me, it would be a better world. <laughs> Isn't that tempting? Yeah. Yeah. Let's just be honest. There, there's no sense in covering up who we really are here because revival starts with honesty and humility. No, Moses, every time, got on his face before God, and it was a challenge to see what Moses would really do. And I want you to know something. If you're facing a challenge today, the reason for it is God wants to see what you're going to do with it. Amen. God's not just up in heaven dangling carrots in front of you saying, nah, 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 you can't have this. God is not up in heaven throwing thunderbolts at you. God is not up in heaven saying, well, let's see how he handles this. <laughs> no, God wants to know what you're going to do. Can you prove that? I'm glad you asked me that. Abraham, take Isaac up on that mountain and offer him. What did God say to Abraham with the knife raised up in the air? Now I know. Now I know. That's what the challenges of life are all about. You know what? We all face them. And every single one is an opportunity for revival or reversal. Your childhood, you can use it for the rest of your life to whine and complain and make excuses. Why? You're not serving God. You can use your childhood. You were abused as a child. You were neglected as a child. You grew up in this kind of a home. You had this happen to you. This tragedy, this calamity. You know what? You can live your whole Christian life going backward because of your childhood. You can live your entire Christian life going backward because of choices you make. 
And every challenge you face is just one more thing on the list. And see, 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 I, it just, I, life is too hard. I can't. I can't. No, it's I won't. That's what the real word is. Because if I read the New Testament, the Bible says I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. If I read the New Testament, but ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. There is no I can't unless God says don't. But there's a lot of I won't. So what do we do with our childhoods? We do what Jabez did. He rose above it. If you have some horrifying, terrifying experience in childhood, if you have a, a, a corrupting influence in childhood, if you, if you grow up with blasphemy and, and all sorts of things that are against God, such as I did, you know what you do? You overcome that Amen. by the power of the Spirit of God, by the Scriptures. Amen. Yep. When choices present themselves... You make the right ones. You refuse the wrong and choose the right by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't end. You don't say, oh, I'm married now. I'm, I'll never be tempted again. That, that's nonsense. You know, we, we live into this, in this idea that, okay, this is the end of temptation. If I just get to this or that. No, you're always going to be tempted. People that start out early in life as drunkards will always be tempted by alcohol. People who are gossips and backbiters will always be tempted to spread a tale. People who are not in mastery of this physical body, as it were. They will be tempted in areas of not taking care of the physical body. And if you don't take care of this physical body, it will not take care of you. You can abuse the physical body for about 40 years. And if you don't get a handle on it, by the time you're 40, you probably never will. But I guarantee if you abuse your body, it will abuse you later. It's a choice. It's refusing and choosing. And there are many areas where people abuse this body. I don't have time to cover them all. But people put things into the body that don't belong there. This body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's not my body to do what I want with. On and on we can go. Our time is up. But I want you to understand this week, as we get into the Word of God, we're dealing with nuts and bolts. We're dealing with reality. We're dealing with foundational issues. We're going to be talking about how to draw nigh to God so He'll draw nigh to you. How to have a fresh work of God in your life. The life of Moses, what he did with his childhood, what he did with his choices, and what he did with his challenges. He invited God in every time. Pastor Loggins.